Hello, I'm Rick Sinding. It's uh, Monday, May 13th, 2013, and we're here at the Eagle Institute of Politics at Rutgers University for the Center on the American Governor. This is part of the development of an archive on the administration of Governor Jim Florio, and today I'll be interviewing John Schuer, who served as Governor Florio's Director of Communications. Okay, John Schuer, welcome. Nice to be here. Um, let's begin with a little bit of your personal background. Uh, where did you grow up? Uh, what did you do before you became involved with Governor Jim Florio? Well, I grew up in Syracuse, New York, and uh, always was interested in politics. My mother was involved in politics up there. And I went to Cornell University, the School of Industrial and Labor Relations, and working as the sports editor of the Cornell Daily Sun gave me a taste for journalism, and I really wanted to go into, into newspaper reporting, but not as a sports writer. So I went out to the University of Missouri and got myself a master's degree in journalism, and then wanted to work on the East Coast and got a job in New Jersey at the Bergen Record, and that's how I came to be a New Jersey person. Okay, and at the Bergen Record, what did you do? Well, I started out covering a couple of towns, Elmwood Park and Saddlebrook. Uh, I was the education writer, I was the county political writer, and then I got to go down to the state house and be the state political writer, which I really enjoyed a lot. And after a few years of that, went down to Washington as the uh, Washington bureau chief. Let's talk a little bit about your experience covering first Bergen County politics and then state politics. What was the tone of what was going on at that time? This would be during the, the Kane administration? Well, it was the Byrne administration. This oh. was the, the mid to late 70s. And, you know, one of the things that I got to do that was really interesting in Bergen County was cover legislative campaigns the year that Byrne was running for re-election. And it was fascinating because, as people remember, everybody thought he was going to get clobbered, and then he wound up winning by a landslide. And I remember how I used to go out with Republican candidates, and they were all wearing their Ray Bateman for governor buttons. And then later in the campaign, they weren't wearing them. I remember saying to somebody, Where, where's your button? He said, oh, I, I think I forgot it. You know, so it was interesting to watch how state politics affected local politics and, and, and legislative politics and how sometimes it's not about the candidate, it's about the times and what's going on and what's happening at the top of the ticket and that sort of thing. Bergen was a pretty Republican county in those days. Well, it's a swing it? county in those days. Um, Democrats won, Republicans won, but you know when you covered legislative campaigns, a lot of it had to do with what was happening at the top of the ticket. When Byrne won that landslide re-election in 1977, he brought in some Democratic legislators who then didn't get to stay very long. Mm -hmm. Did you in '77 cover the gubernatorial primary, or were you still just doing county? Politics? I was. I was doing political county political work then. I, did, so I covered the state elections as they came to us, but I didn't cover state politics. So you didn't have an opportunity at that point to come across. Uh, Congressman Jim Florio in his first run in the primary. No, I watched that. I watched that from a distance. Uh -huh. But okay. I did. I did cover the 1981 gubernatorial primary with the 21 candidates who were in it, and then the the uh, election for governor. At that point, you were at the state house That's as right. the state house yeah. political reporter. That's right. So that must have been your first opportunity to get to know Jim Florio and to cover him and uh, to follow him around on the campaign trail and so forth. How did you find him in that campaign? Well, it's interesting. You know, one of the things as a reporter, especially back in those days, I think it's probably changed, you got to spend a fair amount of time with the candidates. You know, there'd be a day when you might spend it riding around in the car with them. I remember a day when I flew all over the state in a helicopter with Jim Florio. You know, so you, you felt that you, you got to know them a little bit in ways that sort of transcended what they were saying about the issues. You felt that when you finally cast a vote that year as an individual, you would cast it based on your feelings about the person as opposed to what they might have said in the, in the campaign. So I felt like I got to know both of the candidates pretty well. Um, I remember that Tom Kane ran a very laid back campaign with not a lot of stops per day and Jim Florio was going everywhere shaking as many hands as he could and in our sort of ill-informed way of looking at this as reporters, we thought, wow, he's working much harder, he's going to win. And this other guy's not doing very much, and of course it turned out differently. Tom Kane had discovered much more about television ads and, and strategy in the modern era than, than Jim Florio had at that point. I'm not going to ask you how you voted in that election, but I will ask you, um, Jim Florio himself says that he learned a lot in that campaign about sort of what he could do and what he couldn't do, about retail politics. Uh, and um, I think there was a, a, a general feeling that because Kane uh, had this, as you describe it, laid-back campaign, and Florio was constantly on the go, that 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 Florio had this kind of wooden 
um, aut automaton almost like persona. Uh, did you feel as though you penetrated that or did you feel as though you were always dealing with the candidate as opposed to ever dealing with the person? Well, you know, as a reporter, I don't think you ever feel you really penetrate the persona. Um, if you think you have, then someone's done a good job of letting you think that you penetrated the persona. Um, so I don't, I don't know that you can really say, I felt like I really got to know this person, but I didn't really get to know that person. I think you're kind of fooling yourself if you think that. How comfortable were you with, with your relationship with Jim Florio at that point? Well, you know, it was a relationship of a reporter and a candidate. We weren't, we weren't best friends, uh, nor would you expect that to be the case. So I felt like I, like I got to know him. I felt that I understood kind of what made him tick. I, I got a sense of how much he really liked public policy, how he probably liked that more than he liked shaking hands and, and, and doing politics. Um, and I, you know, I respected him. I, I respected both candidates. You know, they, there were some things about that campaign we'll, we'll talk about, but, um, but they both demonstrated they could have been the governor of New Jersey. You know, they were both good on the issues and they both cared a lot about the state. Mm -hmm. How did that campaign play out in, in, in the way in which you were covering it? Well, of course, it was the closest campaign in, in history. And, and, you know, one of the notable things about that campaign was on election day, everybody finding out the Republicans were doing this ballot security task force that was, quite frankly, intimidating urban voters. But in those days, before the Internet, you knowing that as a newspaper reporter on election day couldn't do anything about it. You couldn't write about it until the election was over the next day. That would have been a whole different kind of a thing today. So that was part of it. The other thing was that the, the main thing in that campaign, and this will have a bearing when we start to talk about 1989, Tom Kane had morphed from a Rockefeller Republican to a Reagan Republican. Reagan had been elected president the year before, and that has an impact on New Jersey gubernatorial elections. And Tom Kane said, I'm going to do what Ronald Reagan is doing as president. I'm going to cut the income tax, I'm going to cut the sales tax, and the economy is going to take off. And Jim Florio said, that's not responsible. We can't be cutting the income tax. That's how we pay for property tax relief in New Jersey. And if we cut the income tax, property taxes are going to skyrocket. To which Tom Kane said, see, Jim Florio has a secret plan for raising your taxes. And they got caught in a debate about taxes, which is exactly the kind of campaign a Republican wants to run, and a Democrat really doesn't. And you know, it's hard to say what decided an election that was decided by, what, 1,600 votes. But it framed the, the nature of the debate in a way that was helpful to one candidate and not the other. Do you, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I have to ask coming off of that answer, mm -hmm. do you think that Jim Florio's reluctance to talk about taxes in 1989 was a direct result of his experience in 1981? I think the Florio campaign's smart strategy to not allow taxes to be the issue in 1989 was in some ways a reflection on 1981. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to 1981 now. Um, uh, all right, so the election's over. You're now covering the Kane administration. Right. Jim Florio goes back to Washington. Mm -hmm. How long uh, did you cover Kane before you, or the Kane administration, state politics, right. before you moved on to Washington? Well, I guess so. I covered Kane in 82 and 83 and went down to Washington at the end of 84. Um, and interesting, too, because, you know, not that we as reporters know very much, when we covered the early, day of the, early days of the Kane administration, we were all saying, this, there's no way this guy can get reelected. He broke his promise, he raised taxes, he's inefficient, his front office is a mess, he's speaking with three voices instead of one, one chief of staff, and, and he's finished. You know? Well, of course, he got reelected with 70% of the vote, which showed you what we knew. Well, the first year of the, of the Kane administration, yeah. I think even by, I don't know, I haven't reviewed the, the Kane archive that yeah. closely, but I yeah. think by most people's uh, uh, re recollection, um, was a difficult sure. period. But that um, has a bearing as we go forward, too. Well, the first year of any administration is difficult in terms of figuring out who's going to be doing what and who's going mm -hmm. to be speaking for the governor, and we'll get to that when we get to sure. 1989. Um, but, but by 1983 and 1984, yeah. Kane had really regained his, his position of popularity. That's right. Uh, how did he do that? Um, what, was it because he got all of the difficult issues having to do with taxes behind him quickly and then moved well, along to things that were more popular? Not only did he get, behind, get, get them behind him, but the economy took off. Now, he said the economy would take off if you, wrote, if you cut taxes, he raised taxes. It still took off because state taxes had nothing to do with the economy. Um, but then he got to be the governor in a time of great prosperity. 
I mean, I was told they used to have cabinet meetings, and Governor Kane would say to his cabinet, would you please find some more ways to spend money? You know, so, you know, he was able to give things to people, which is great. I mean, I'm not, I'm not knocking that. What governor wouldn't want to do that? And he had a good personality. He traveled a lot of places. He went around the state. He appeared in tourism ads. He was the first governor to do that. So, you know, he got to show a very good-natured side of himself at a time when the state was rolling in money, when there was no real crisis going on. And, and, and I think it ought to be said, too, that part of his success was the skill he showed in avoiding some of the crises. You know, New Jersey still had a financial problem. We still were spending more money than we were taking in. We still were, had much too high an over-reliance on property taxes. And during the Kane administration, a commission was formed that made these great recommendations for how we could use more on state revenues and less on local property taxes. And that commission was bipartisan and it unanimously recommended going forward. And Tom Kane said no. You know, so he was kind of able to stay popular and not spend political capital that, had he spent it, he might have gone down from 70 to 60 percent in popularity and solved some of the state's big problems. The famous Slurp Commission. Exactly. Um, by that time, though, you're in Washington. Right. And what is covering Washington for the Bergen record like? It was, you know, it's, it's funny because when I left Trenton to go to Washington, someone else at the record who had done both things said, well, I really enjoyed Trenton better. And when he said it, I thought, oh, you've got to be kidding me. How could you enjoy Trenton more than Washington? Well, I did too, <laughs> as it turned out, because you were a very small fish in a big pond. And, you know, the record wanted you to cover national things in, Trent, in Washington, but nobody knew who you were. I, I used to go to Reagan press conferences in the White House and then come back and look at the AP story to figure out what I should write. You know, it was, like, it was like covering a town council meeting when you'd never been in the town before. You didn't know what was news and what wasn't. So, you know, it, it was kind of frustrating. And uh, it was fun, and I enjoyed it. But looking back, covering state politics in Trenton was in a lot of ways more fulfilling than trying to cover national politics in Washington. My recollection time. of the time is that the record did not want you to, uh, did not want its Washington reporter to cover Bergen County right. from Washington, right. or to cover necessarily New Jersey-oriented stories in Washington. That's right. So, and looking back, it would have been better if they did, I think. Mm -hmm. How did you get to know the congressional delegation reasonably well, anyway? Fairly well. I, mean, I knew some. You know, a lot of them had been in the state house as legislators, and so I think I got to know them fairly well. But we really didn't cover them very much. All right, but you did cover Jim Florio from time to time, and obviously you must have come to his attention. Uh, because at some point uh, he offered you a job. Right. Um, was this something that you sought out, or did he seek you out? How did this happen, and I, when? I didn't seek it out, and it was in 1987. Um, and I got a call one day from Florio's press secretary saying, Jim would like to have breakfast with you. Can you make it at such and such a date? And it was, I, I thought, 8 o'clock in the morning? Wow, that's awfully early. Um, but Jim Florio gets up early. I was going to say, not for um, him. <laughs> and so we had breakfast, and he said that he offered me the job of being his congressional press secretary with the likely understanding that he was going to go up back up to New Jersey and run for governor. Was this to replace the press secretary who called you and asked no. you to do it? Oh, that, yes, that's right. He uh -huh. was leaving to do another, to work in another state. Um, so I, I was flattered. I thought about it for a while. I actually kind of agonized over it because I felt on the one hand like I really like politics and I'd like to work for someone as their press secretary, but is now the time I want to do that? You know, and then I thought, but you don't get to pick what the time is, you know, and I, I'd like Jim Flora. I had a lot of respect for him. So it kind of came down to, well, you know, if you ever want to do this, you kind of have to do it when somebody asks you to. You can't say no, and then two years later when you want to, nobody's offering the job. So after thinking about it for a long time, I, uh, I, ma I made the switch and, uh, and, and really never looked back. It was one of those decisions where you agonized right up to the time you made it, and as soon as you made it, it felt right. Mm -hmm. what, what, did you make that decision based primarily on the notion that you would be working for a congressman in Washington, or because you understood that this was likely to mean that you would be involved in a campaign when he ran for governor? Well, the fact that it would involve a campaign for governor was certainly an enticement. Um, Did he make it clear that he was interested in running for governor yes. again in 89? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, he hadn't declared, there was no final decision, but he made it, it was clear to me that if I took this job, there was a good chance I, I could be part of a, of a gubernatorial campaign. And, you know, since my background was in state politics and not national issues, that was in, intriguing to me as well. Now, do you think, uh, I mean, I would ask him this question, but I'll, I'll ask you and, and you could decline to answer if you want. <laughs> do you think that he chose you or sought you out because of your knowledge of state politics and state media and government 
knowing that you would fill this role when he would run for governor, or do you think it was a, do you think it was less calculated than that? Well, you know, I, I think he liked me. I, I think he had a good relationship with me. And I also think that he felt that as you get ready for a statewide campaign, you should have some people around you who know New Jersey, or in my case especially, who know New Jersey journalists. And so I felt, I think he probably felt that, you know, having someone who knew these reporters and had gotten along with them and had worked with them fairly recently would, would be an asset, which I think, you know, if I were advising someone about choosing a press secretary, I would say the same thing. You want, you want a journalist, and you want a journalist who's fairly close to a lot of other journalists and has been, hasn't been out of commission that long that he can't still bring back those relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the time of year? We're, are we in 87? Yeah, so this is the summer of 87. Okay, so roughly a year and a half before he right. is running in the primary in, in 1989. Mm -hmm. How much, uh, for the first year, let's say, mid-87 to mid-88, are you primarily involved in national politics and in his committee activities and so forth? with an eye toward what's going to be going on in 89, or are you already gearing up for an 89 gubernatorial run? Well, not really totally gearing up. Um, I was officially on the staff of the subcommittee that Congressman Florio chaired, the Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer Protection, and Competitiveness, I think it was. And, um, and I did a lot of work on toy safety and Superfund sites and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and I, I vowed to myself, having been a reporter, that I would be responsive to every reporter who ever called, and I would make sure that we gave them whatever they need. And then I started to get phone calls from people in Kansas about Superfund sites, and I realized that's not quite so important as some other things that I'm, that I'm doing. So sure, we sp spent a lot of attention on New Jersey reporters, but, but the work was broader than that at that point. Mm -hmm. And then at what point did he, did you morph into campaign mode? Well, I can't remember exactly when it was, but after a while there were meetings in New Jersey on, on off hours from congressional business and starting to put a campaign together and starting to talk about the issues. So probably by some point in 1988, we were sort of moving more into that mode. Now, there's, as, as I understand it, there are some very clear uh, sort of ethical lines in, involved in when you're on a congressional payroll, you're working on congressional business, uh, and there's a, there's a, a, a wall between that activity and, and, and retail political activity. At what point do you did you cross that line? Did you actually have to go on to the campaign staff? Or yeah. Did you leave the congressional staff and move to the campaign staff? Yeah, early in 1989, I left the federal government payroll and went on to the campaign payroll. Because okay. you know, there, you're right, there are rules, and we certainly wanted, wanted to follow them. And at that point, are you then, did you then move back to New Jersey, or well, are you still I, in Washington? My, my wife and baby son were in Maryland, and I went, basically spent uh, weekdays in New Jersey at my mother-in-law's house in Bergen County. Mm -hmm. And um, let's talk about the 80, let's, okay, we're, we're into the next phase <laughs> okay. now. We're into the, the 1989 gubernatorial primary, mm -hmm. all right? This is your first time inside a campaign right. and, and viewing it from the inside out rather than from the outside in. How is it different from, uh, give, give us some of your impressions sure. of early on how it differed from what you expected it to be. Well, I think anybody who'd been through this experience would say this. It's not as well organized from the inside as you think it is from the outside. The decisions that are made are made much more at the spur of the moment than you thought they were. And, and, and partly because, you know, a good campaign is sort of like a, a good campaign in battle. Um, it's not the person who has the best plan, it's the person who can adapt the quickest to things as they change and can take advantage of opportunities. And so that's what, really what the campaign was more about than this master plan kind of a thing. So that was part of it. The other thing that I learned was that it, it was interesting, I can remember as the press secretary from time to time going to the people who were in the issues department and I would say, oh, I think we have to respond to this or we have to say this or that and they would say, we can't say that, we can't say that, we can't say that. And finally I remember saying something, well you know we have to say something. We can't go through this whole campaign and never say anything. So, so what was interesting is, is, is learning that even within the campaign, it's not as well oiled as you think there might be. I mean, this wasn't horrible tension, but tension between the press side, perhaps, and the, and the issue side. And the other thing that I learned was, you know, nobody goes to the issues side of a campaign and says, I can help you with issues. 
Nobody goes to the fundraising side and says, I can help you raise money. But everybody goes to the press secretary. <laughs> oh, I know how to get you a newspaper store. I know how to get attention. You should do it this way. You should say that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of interesting that everybody wants to be the press secretary. Everybody so, within the campaign you're talking about? Yes. I see. <laughs> um, how did you resolve issues where everybody is saying to you or other people are saying to you, you can't say this, you can't say that? Do you then go to the candidate and say, what do I say? Or do you go to the candidate and say, I think we ought to say thus and such? Or Yeah, sort of I mean, you, the, the candidate or the campaign manager or both. I mean, these things always got resolved one way or the other, sometimes in favor of doing what I suggested, sometimes not. Um, but it was, a, you know, it was a very collegial campaign. It was not a campaign where there were outward rivalries or people fighting for control. Everybody, had, everybody knew their role, including the candidate, which is a very important thing in a, in, a, in a campaign because a candidate needs to sort of grasp the idea that I'm not the press secretary, I'm not the scheduler, I'm not the issue director, I'm the candidate, and I go do those kinds of things. And in that sense, it was very, very well run. Uh, it was uh, hmm, that's a, it's an interesting point. Do you think that Jim Florio in 1981 may have paid more attention to the specifics of running the campaign and less to his sort of overall position as the the CEO of the campaign, yeah. and that and that in the second time around he he delegated more? Well, don't forget, 81. I'm watching it from the outside, so I think it's okay. well run. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, I think that is the case. And I think that's true of almost anybody who runs for state office the first time versus the second time. You get a sense, a bit greater sense of what it should be like. And as a candidate for governor the second time, I think that he realized, I'm not running for Congress. It's not about shaking hands at, at factory gates and, and that sort of thing. So yes, I think there's a, truly a learning curve there. My recollection of, of covering uh, political gubernatorial campaigns um, was that everybody wants a piece of the candidate. Yeah. Um, they're, they're willing to go through the press secretary to get an answer to a particular question or to go to one of the issues people on a specific issue. But what they mostly want is time with the candidate yeah. himself. How did you deal with that? How accessible did you make Jim Florio to the uh, media during the course of that campaign? I'd say the strategy was not to make him inaccessible, but not to make him totally accessible, to make him accessible enough that people who want him to be accessible could feel like he was, um, without spending all of our time, you know, spending, hanging out with reporters. Mm -hmm. And how successful do you think that was? I mean, do you think that there was a good rapport between him and the press corps during that campaign? I, Let's I stick do. with the primary. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. You know, I, I'll tell you one funny story that I, that I probably shouldn't, but I will. Um, one time, poll results got reported by a newspaper reporter during the primary campaign. And we on the campaign staff were aghast this had happened. You know, we had a meeting. And it was Your like, own poll? You mean the internal yes, one, poll? Yes, an internal uh -huh. poll was... was Reported by a reporter. It was leaked to, to a reporter. And, and so we not, had a meeting not saying... By, not by you, I presume. Well, not by me. No, it's funny. You know, when you become a press secretary after, you, after you're a reporter, everybody always assumes it's you. And then they realize you'd be the last person to do it because right. everybody well, thinks you're the first person to do it. unless you want to. Well, but you didn't want to. But anyway, so we had a meeting saying, don't let the, we can't let this happen. Don't, don't well, we never found who let that poll out. After a while, we said, you know, we think we know who it was. We think it was the candidate. Uh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, next time we see so, him, we'll have to ask him that well, question. So, so, yeah, don't tell him I said so. So, um, so, the, so the point is, you know, at the end of the day, the candidate is still the candidate, and nobody can make the candidate do or not do anything. However, I think in that 89 uh, primary, it was, it was pretty well run. Everybody knew their roles, played, the, played them well, and it, was, and, and it had a good result. Now, unlike the previous Gubernator Democratic gubernatorial primaries, this one was not a, uh, a, a, a huge right. um, Donnybrook. Uh, there were three candidates. Uh, Jim Florio was the clear right. front runner, um, uh, almost, uh, almost a coronation, if you will. Um, but how, I, I mean, did you feel that way all the way through the primary, or did you feel as though and did the candidate and the campaign feel as though you had to run this very competitively yeah. and, and, and go, go out and search for every vote you could get? Well, yeah, I mean, I, we didn't think we were going to lose just the way nobody thought we were going to lose because we weren't going to lose. And part of it was the fundraising we had, the support we had. I mean, remember, a primary is still an intra-party affair. And so who's endorsing you, who's with you, who's going to come out and vote is an important thing. 
But we also had to take it pretty seriously. I remember one, we did a debate with the two other candidates. And as far as we were concerned, one debate, that's fine. We don't have to debate these people again. And I can recall the press kind of clamoring for another debate. And at one point, I remember going to some of the campaign leaders and saying, you know, I think we should debate one more time because we have nothing to lose in a debate, but we do have something to lose if we kind of get this image with the press that we're shirking debates and don't want to go out and do things in public. So I don't even remember. I think we did do the second debate, but it was more because we felt like, yeah, you didn't want to go into the gubernatorial campaign with his reputation as a, as a reclusive candidate who didn't cooperate with the press and didn't want to do things in public. So to some extent, a lot of what we did in that primary was an eye toward how do we position ourselves for the general election campaign that we felt pretty confident we would be in unless something really drastic had happened. It was a fairly collegial primary, as I recall. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, one of the things uh, that... You Alan Karcher was a, was a combative person, but he was less combative with Jim Florio, certainly, than he had been with Tom Kane. Well, that, that, that's probably true. But one of the things you learn when you go inside campaigns also and get to watch politicians up close is that they don't like each other that much. I don't mean to say they hate each other, but, you know, politicians are competing against each other. It's, it's sort of like athletes. There's some respect there, but they don't, you know, they don't at the end of the day go out and hang out together and talk about how the campaign is going. So, you know, it was respectful, it was serious, and it was something that we were anxious to get through so we could get on to the main event. Mm -hmm. Okay, speaking of the main event, now it's, uh, well, no, actually, before we get there, who, who called the shots in the primary? How, how, how many of the key decisions, first of all, were there a lot of key decisions mm -hmm. that were made during the primary campaign? Uh, if so, um, was it a shared responsibility between Doug Berman, the campaign manager, and Jim Florio, the candidate? Were there other people who were involved in the decision-making process? Yeah. How, how hierarchical was the, was the well, structure? Well, I would say that, that the, the candidate and Doug Berman, the campaign manager, were the, the two most important people as far as making decisions. We had, you know, we had consultants we paid, a pollster, media consultants, and they, they were involved as well. But, you know, I think the, the primary campaign was really how do we just stay on course? You know, how do we show strength? Because part of winning a primary is to show how strong you are in the general election. So how do we just kind of maintain those expectations, meet those expectations, and not have anything damaging enough happen in a, in a primary that somehow you're at a disadvantage in the, in the fall campaign. Who were the media consultants and how did you deal with them? The media consultants, the, the, the firm that we hired was um, Bob Squire and Carter Eskew and um, Bill Knapp. They Washington, were Washington pretty much the preeminent They were good, uh, yeah. Um, you know, we'd interviewed a, a bunch of different consultants and the candidate and everybody else felt very comfortable with these guys. Were Bob's, you involved in that interviewing process? I was, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I knew some of them because I, they'd done New Jersey campaigns before. So I kind of felt like I'd gotten to know them when I was a reporter and, and worked with them. And they were, they were pretty down-to-earth people. They were smart. They were tough. Um, Bob Squire, you know, did some one-on-one -on -one work with, with Jim Flory that was really impressive. You know, it was the first time he'd ever used a teleprompter was when he gave his announcement speech for the gubernatorial campaign. And so it was, um, it was all very, um, they were very helpful. They were, they, were, they were pros. And I think that, I think part of what the candidate had learned from 1981 was you want to, surround yourself with people who really know what, they, what they're doing. Jim used to joke that he said, my, my TV consultant in 1981 had only done radio before. <laughs> you know, so I think he was wanting to surround himself with the best people. Well, it's, it, it really says something, doesn't it, that uh, 1989, which is 24 years ago, yeah. uh, the, in, his, in his announcement for governor was the first time that Jim Florio used a teleprompter. Yeah, well, I mean, how, have how, how, many, how many politicians today would would, yeah. would not have used a teleprompter the, virtually the very first time. Yeah, there was a speech. real, it was a real watershed time in New Jersey. You know, New Jersey is a state that came later to television commercials for candidates than, you know, in 1977, I think it was the first time there were ever primary election commercials on TV for a gubernatorial election. Yeah, and that was because Bob Rowe had raised so much yeah. money that he could actually spend so, it. So, so, you know, it was, it was things had changed. Mm -hmm. Um, media buys were and continue to be very expensive in New Jersey because yep. there is no commercial television station in New Jersey and New York and Philadelphia media are very expensive. Yep. How extensive a use did you make of, of media buys in the 1989 general election? Yeah, well, and New York is the most expensive market in the country and Philadelphia the fourth most. Uh, we, we made very extensive use of that. Um, I think one of the things that, that we learned, you know, one of the things that, that helped Tom Kane back in 81 is that his TV commercials really were his campaign. 
And then when he went on the road, he echoed the themes of those commercials. In the Florio campaign, the TV commercials were, an, were more an adjunct of the campaign. By 1989, we'd learned that you drive the message on your 30-second TV commercials, and then you reinforce that message wherever you go. And so we drove a very strong message. And I think this is, this is interesting. When, when Governor Florio announced his candidacy, we did it in Hoboken for the New York TV media, and we went down to Asbury Park, raced down the parkway to get to Asbury Park, which was the northernmost point the Philadelphia media would come to. So we did it in two places to get media in two markets, free media. We gave a, he gave a speech that was all about one thing, clean water. So I'm going to clean up the beaches, which is a huge issue in 1989, and I'm going to make sure we have safe drinking water. And the print press was all, that was a terrible announcement speech. He only talked about one thing. He didn't give all the things he wants to do for New Jersey. And we kind of laughed because every time you turn on TV that day, it said, vowing to clean the beaches and have clean water. Jim Florio announced his candidacy for governor. It was the only message that could be on TV because it's the only message we gave. So we felt pretty good about that, and the press kind of didn't understand. And that day, we had no availability with the print press. And they were upset, but we said, tomorrow, he'll come to Trenton, he'll answer questions for as long as you want. And we did it for about an hour and a half, but we got our message out in the, in the first day of the campaign. We, as we go farther, we'll learn that it's easier to get your message out as a candidate than it is as a governor. <laughs> and you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. But what was important in 89 was, you know, we won that election with 60% of the vote. When that happens, you look back and you think, well, there's no way he could have lost. It's not true. You know, he could have lost. It's not just about winning the debate, it's about shaping the terms of the debate. You could envision another campaign in 89, like 81, where the Republican says, I'm going to cut taxes, and the Democrat is somehow caught flat-footed, and the whole thing is about taxes. You know, because don't forget, in 89, the year before, George Bush had beaten Dukakis, and he was tough and beat up Dukakis on his patriotism and that kind of stuff, so there was a need for a Democratic candidate to be tough but also to be disciplined and to help set the tone of what would be the issues in that campaign. Discipline was a word that came up in my interview with Carl Van Horn. Um, I think it's a, a, a term that will come up frequently in talking to people who were involved in the 89 campaign. Yeah. It was a very, very disciplined campaign with, with clear messaging that would take place almost on a daily basis, sometimes on a weekly basis. How scripted, I mean, you say that, that, that yeah. campaigns are, are less, um, uh, you know, decisive or well-run or, or organized than they may appear to be, but there was a clear organization and pattern in terms of messaging to the Florio campaign. How, how, who made the decisions of, of when you were going to roll out certain messages right. and, and stick to that message for that day or that week? Right. Well, and there was, you know, there, there come a time when we're going to talk about clean water. Okay. Let's tack away from that. Let's talk about car insurance now. Um, so we wanted to kind of set the themes and always have the opponents sort of trying to catch up to us on that. And that was, that was Doug Berman, the campaign manager, the candidate, the consultants. For the most part, that's who was, was making those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, for the general election, Brenda Bacon had come on to be the director of issues, and she was involved in that as well. Um, but it was, it was, you know, like in any campaign, it's a fairly small group of people making the, the major decisions. How involved were you in making any policy decisions versus making media decisions or communication decisions? Mainly media and communications decisions. You know, how should we talk about various things? Um, I remember when, um, and you know, when you win with 60% of the vote and you're not an incumbent, you also got some help from your opponent. And I remember when our opponent, you know, got quoted saying he didn't think that gay people should be allowed to teach in schools. You know, and so we came back with something, and I and I think my line was something like, "This is New Jersey, 1989. It's not Mississippi in 1962." You know, we we care about people's rights. So you know, sometimes my job was to maybe come up with a line that might be the, the soundbite for the day and that sort of thing, and and think about how we should package and present the issues that we wanted to talk about. My my strongest recollection of that campaign in terms of of mm -hmm. differentiating between the two candidates was a debate in which uh, Jim Corder, the Republican candidate, uh, talked about uh, how he had a particularly strong environmental record yeah. compared to Jim Florio. Uh, and when it came to Jim Florio's time, to, he, he turned to <clears throat> Jim Corder and said, cut me a break, yeah. um, and got a huge sort of outpouring of yeah. applause. Um, that theme, the theme, environmental themes were, a, were perhaps the dominant theme from the, yeah. from the Florio point of view. 
Um, was that a calculated decision from the very beginning that the environment was going to be a top issue? Absolutely. It was a super important issue to the people of New Jersey. You know, beaches had been closed, syringes were washing ashore, there were places having problems with drinking water. Florio had a reputation nationally, on, he was the author of the Superfund bill. So, yeah, it all, it all came together in a politically good but also policy good way because there really was nothing that people in New Jersey cared about more at that point. And I, I remember also that. You know, our opponent's first TV ad was kind of a positive ad about some environmental award he'd gotten that like 400 other congressmen had also gotten. It was kind of like an honorable mention for showing up award. Um, and, you know, we looked at that and said, well, we're not going to allow this. To, you know, we're not going like, to make this look like there's two candidates with equal records on the environment. And so, you know, we, we kind of went, went negative. There was some, some ugly substance found on some land that our opponent owned, and we made a TV ad about that. And, you know, we kind of made sure that, that we tried to drive and control that message. Another recollection I have is that you, the, the, that the Florio uh, campaign prided itself on responding to every single charge or every single issue that got raised by the opponent. That's a slightly different position from a lot that, that yeah. other campaigns would take where sometimes the decision, the calculated decision is made to just ignore what the opponent yeah. is saying. I can think of, a, of an example of that that I think told a lot about this campaign and helped to set the tone of it. Um, at, at the national level, there was talk in Washington about a constitutional amendment to ban flag burning, make it a, make it a federal offense. And a short story appeared in, in one of the papers in New Jersey that somebody had gotten up on the floor of the legislature the day before and said, you know, when Jim Florio was an assemblyman, there was a vote on flag burning and he didn't vote, you know, and it was a tiny story. And the first kind of inclination in the campaign was, this is nothing, just leave it alone. And then Doug and I talked and we said, wait a minute, we have an opportunity here. We did some research. We found out it was a minor bill about municipal jurisdiction. Other legislators who didn't vote that day included Tom Kane. You know? So the next day, our candidate went to the War Memorial in Trenton with veterans wearing their American Legion hats behind him. And he just got up there and he said, if my opponent wants to challenge my patriotism, he should have the guts to do it to my face. <laughs> And I was standing next to Joe Merlino, the former state senate president from Trenton, and he looked at me and he said, we got ourselves a candidate. And again, this is a year after Dukakis, who was you know, made fun of, he wasn't patriotic, he was an ACLU. And that kind of thing where you didn't, that wasn't in the playbook, we didn't plan that issue, but when we saw it, we said, we're going to react to this. And we, set a, we set, sent a message to the press, to the opponent, to the public, this guy's tough. You're not going to push him around like, like you've seen other Democrats get pushed around before. So that was a case of just reacting on the fly to something, doing the research to show what it really was, and then pounding it. Now, is that a situation where you and Doug sit down, uh, figure this out, and then go to Jim Florio and say, what do you think of this? Or is this a, a kind of thing where Jim Florio himself would say to you, I want to respond to this? I think in that particular instance, Doug and I were looking at it. I think Jim was in Washington. And we were looking at it. And we said, we think there's an opportunity here. And we went to him. And, and, and he agreed to do it. One final recollection about the 89 campaign before we move on to the transition and then the, uh, uh, and then the, the term of the administration. Um, the, I remember one uh, political observer, pundit, uh, making the prediction uh, in the 1989 gubernatorial election uh, that there were two things that were absolutely certain. Uh, the first is that the next governor of New Jersey was going to be a former congressman named Jim. Uh, and the other was that within the first three to six months, one of the first things he would do is raise taxes. Mm -hmm. um, the understanding, uh, the, the, the widespread understanding among the State House press corps and certainly among people who paid close attention to New Jersey politics was that there was a striking, looming budget deficit and that New Jersey was headed toward a very, very difficult budgetary time. I know that Tom Kane, the incumbent governor, was consistently saying, uh, we've got a surplus, there's no problem here. Um, but it, there came a time during the campaign when Jim Florio uh, felt compelled to say that he saw no need to raise taxes in the foreseeable, I don't think he used the phrase foreseeable did, future, yeah. which was a Brendan Burns statement from eight years earlier, <clears throat> or 12 years or 14, 18 years earlier. Um, but he did say that he saw no need to, to, to raise taxes, um, and which took a number of observers aback. Mm -hmm. um, why did he do that? Um, in retrospect, do you think that had he not said that, had he simply remained silent, um, that it would not have come back to haunt him when the time came in the first six months of the administration right. to actually go ahead and raise taxes? 
I think actually the phrase was, I see no need for new taxes, which theoretically doesn't rule out tax increases, but there's no reason to parse that, and we didn't, and we didn't parse that either, but just for the record. A couple of things. Had he said, well, I might have to raise taxes when I'm governor, I think it's very likely he wouldn't have been governor. And that's the nature of the debate between Democrats and Republicans in this state and this country. Republicans want to run campaigns where they say they're going to cut taxes, and they want to push Democrats into being able to be painted as someone who's going to raise taxes. It's an overly simplistic um, dichotomy. It's hurting our country even today that we have these debates like that. So I would argue the smart thing to do was to have a very quick answer. I see no need for new taxes. And let's have this debate about car insurance. Let's have it about the environment. A couple other things that I think are important to point out. There's a history in New Jersey of governors raising taxes after saying they weren't going to. Brendan Byrne runs in 73. I see no income tax in the foreseeable future. He passes an income tax. He gets reelected in a landslide. As we mentioned, Tom Kane, 81, I'm going to cut the income tax. I'm going to cut the sales tax. He raises both. He gets reelected in an even bigger landslide. So there was reason to believe from precedent that a governor, when they got into office, would do the right thing, raise taxes, and be able to recover from it. The last point, which you made, is a huge point. When you've got the incumbent governor, who's extremely popular, going around the state saying, we've got a surplus, there's no problem. So if any candidate for governor says, oh, no, that's wrong, we have a big problem, now you're running against Tom Kane. Why would you run against the incumbent if he's not running again? So I think everything pointed to the fact that it was, I think, the right political strategy. You know, you can't do anything as governor if you don't get elected as governor. Um, and so I think to try to focus the debate in the areas where you want it to be, to wait until this issue comes up and people have a broader understanding of it after you're elected, I think it's the right thing to do. Now, it causes problems, and we'll talk about that, but I don't think doing it the other way would have been advisable. Understandable. Okay, let's move to election night, 1989. Um, you're, wherever you were, I think it was at, was at uh, East Brunswick, yeah, the, right. um, the usual Democratic hangout on election night. Um, Actually, actually, even before that, for maybe the three or four weeks before that, yeah. it had become fairly obvious that Jim Florio was going to win election. Yeah. At that point, are you focused at all on the transition to his being governor, or are you constantly in campaign mode right up to the last minute? Actually, it was funny. I think I was in, in a room at the Woodbridge Hilton with the candidate. He was resting between events. And I, said, I think I said something like, so... Do you think it's over? He said, yeah, I think it is. Um, How, and, and when was this? It's, it's some t within a, two or three probably weeks of, of election day, you know, because that was the sense. I mean, you know, if you're going to win 60-40, it's not a surprise on election night. Election night was actually in some ways an anti-climax. Um, and actually, what I remember emotionally back then is the campaign became less fun after that. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, we won. It's over. You know, now we have to think about governing. Um, and, and so I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about the transition then. I, you know, I had a little bit of talking with people about how governors set up their offices. But it almost, it almost seemed like you didn't want to jinx it. You know, you wanted to kind of, this was, this was going on. You wanted to ride this for, until, until it was over. And then there's, you know, there's time to plan a transition. You get, you get a fair amount of time between Election Day and the, and the inauguration. So I, I would say that my own focus throughout the campaign stayed mainly on the campaign. All right. So you, you worked for Jim Florio when he was a congressman on the congressional payroll. You come off that payroll onto a campaign payroll. Right. Now the election is over. There is no longer a campaign. Where are you? What well, are you going to do now? Well, there, there, there is a payroll for transitions for gubernatorial uh, before inauguration. So I was on the transition payroll at that All point. Right. And, and it was just automatically assumed that you would, you would transition to the transition. Yes. I, you know, I don't, I don't recall being told I'd be in the administration. I think at one point Doug Berman said, well, you know, when we win the election, do you want to be the, continue to be the communications director or do you want to be the press secretary? And I said, oh, I want to be the communications director. Um, but what? other than that, I think it was pretty assumed that I was going to stay in the administration. What's the difference between the communications well, director and the, the press secretary? the communications director is more involved in overall strategy and the press secretary more with implementing that strategy and doing more day-to-day -day talking with reporters. Now, I'll, I'll uh, reveal my age. I remember a day when governors didn't even have press secretaries or directors yeah, of communication. Right. Uh, now, now suddenly, not suddenly, but now they had both. Well, Tom one, Kane really pioneered having both. You know, he had a, a very smart communications director who helped 
really sort of the thematics of the cam of, the, of the, the campaign. When I say the campaign, I mean the campaign when you are governor. That's the campaign to get your issues passed and and get your popularity. And high. that was Greg Stevens. Greg Stevens and Bob Grady was also part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then Carl Golden was the press secretary. A very important job. Well, not so much the major strategy, but basically the care and feeding of reporters, which is an, an important thing as well. And you preferred the overall strategy, the overall communication strategy, to the day-to-day -day feeding of reporters. Well, you, not as much as I thought I would. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go on. I kind of missed the the day-to-day. -day. And, you know, one of the features of our administration was that, you know, Doug Berman, who had really been the chief of communications as campaign manager, kind of stayed in that role as treasurer. You know, as far as the overall message and the thematics of, of the administration with the key goal of getting getting the state's finances in order. Um, so in some ways, he kind of kept his role, and I kind of kept my role. Well, um, that kind of raises an interesting question. You say Doug Berman was sort of the chief communications officer. Um, is, is, is Treasury the appropriate place for the person who holds that position? I mean, uh, quite aside from the, well, from the, from the personalities yeah. involved. I think what's, what's, whatever works is what's appropriate. I mean, the same thing had happened in the Byrne administration when Dick Leone was the state treasurer and helped, you know, kind of mastermind the, the getting the state's finances in order piece of it. I think it's, you know, it, they gotta, it's got to be someone the governor knows well, trusts, and that sort of thing, someone who's smart in those kinds of areas. And so, you know, I, I think it was, it, it was bumpy because you, when you're the treasurer, too, you maybe don't have as much time to do these things as, as you would like, but I don't know that it's a question of what's appropriate or not. Well, there was no question, however, that for the first six months of the administration, I mean, obviously there were a number of major initiatives. There was automobile insurance, there was uh, um, uh, assault weapons, sure. um, but, the, but, but the dominant theme was budgetary and fiscal. Yep. Um, so perhaps the person who had been running the campaign and who was, as you put it, sort of the chief communicator of the campaign would want to be in the treasurer's position, which was gonna clearly be the most yep. influential. Um, however, early on, um, I, I guess when, I'll, I'll use this famous, uh, you, you could hold that up to the camera, um, which, which you and others from the uh, gubernatorial offices uh, wore to the Legislative Correspondence Club dinner in May of that year, um, that Doug Berman uh, was the only person who was authorized to speak on behalf of the administration uh, before the legislative budget committees. Um, there was a lot of anger uh, directed toward the administration, not just by Republicans, but yep. by some Democrats as well, uh, that this reflected a, an arrogance and an unwillingness of the administration to be open and uh, uh, have a two-way street with legislators. Yeah. Um, from your vantage point, from a communication standpoint, did you ever have reason to question that decision? Did you have internal discussions with Doug Berman or with the governor about whether that was an, a, a wise decision? I can recall the meeting where that decision was made. It was a senior staff meeting, and the issue was raised, and Doug said, you know, a lot of these cabinet folks are brand new. They really, some of them come from out of state. Some of them are holdovers from the Kane administration. We don't know what they're going to say about our, our, our budget. He said, so I think it makes sense if I just answer all the questions. And there was not a dissenting voice in that room, myself included. We all said, yeah, yeah that makes sense. You, yeah, sure. Let's, you know, and, and, and then shortly after, I remember a story appearing in the Asbury Park Press where an unnamed source was saying, well, you know, the Florida administration is arrogant, using that as an example. And I remember thinking, we're arrogant? We're not arrogant. <laughs> we're just doing what makes sense, and we're disciplined. And so I, I think that was, you know, sort of my first inkling that that discipline can also cut the other way when other people say, you know, you're being arrogant or this or that. And, and you know, when you're, when you're the governor, you'd think you, have, you can control the message, but in fact, anybody who wants to criticize you, and they don't even have to have their names used, can get a reporter to write a story, because that's a pretty sexy story. Wow, the governor's office is angering people around, around the state house. So, so I think that, you know, I don't know whether I would say it would have been better if they testified on their own, because I don't know what they were going to say. Um, but looking back on that, you know, that was a kind of a drastic step where we're thinking about how disciplined we are but the, but the blowback from it is, is that other people are saying, wow, you know, in the campaign, you get, you get credit from the press for being disciplined. As governor, yeah. suddenly that's arrogance. So, you know, there's other factors. Well, it, it, does, this, does this reflect a certain naivete in terms of relations with the legislature? Um, 
and 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 did you ever have occasion, or do you know if anyone in the in the, in the hierarchy of the administration ever had occasion to sort of rethink this a, a few months later and say, hey, maybe we need to do something to recapture some yeah. of the lost relationship that developed there? Well, I think every administration that comes in has some naivete. Um, it's it's the the one job you do that you've never done before, you know, and I think that's true of every governor. And 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 the other thing about it is that. You know, we had a strong sense of what needed to be done. And, and to his credit, we had a leader who was willing to do it, you know, who, was, who knew there were huge political risks in raising the income tax and raising the sales tax, but who looked at the numbers. I remember he used to go to budget briefings, and people in the Treasury staff would say, we've never had a governor come to these briefings before. He's really interested. He really knows the state budget. You know, so I think from his standpoint and our standpoint, so we know what we've got to do. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Now, the first item out of the box was automobile insurance reform. Um, not not a, a, a heavy lift from the standpoint of the fact that other governors had tried and yeah. failed to reform uh, auto insurance, um, but there was a clear need to do something. Yeah. Um, and Florio had a mandate from the election. It had been a major theme of the campaign, and so that was clearly the number one issue to drive the administration, no pun intended, uh, into the first, uh, oh, let's say, month or two. Um, how much uh, time was spent by you, specifically, and your staff? Um, well, that actually, the, pause for a second. Did you have a staff? I had a staff. There were a few people okay. who worked with right. me, yeah. Um, to, to, um, Develop the message that would be sent regarding auto insurance and the and the campaign, if you will, yeah. for getting the auto insurance reforms passed. You know that was a fairly short campaign. I remember that in the inaugural speech, we we, we made a pledge to to get that done and get it done quickly, and 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 we did. So I, I don't recall. You know, it was mainly kind of an inside campaign. It was working with the legislature. It was getting the right people on the right committees who didn't have ties to the insurance industry um, and, and just kind of getting that done. So that wasn't really so much a public and a media campaign. I remember one thing we did when we finally got it all done, we brought in the Batmobile and we had a little bit of a celebration, which kind of backfired, you know. And, and, and one of the things that I learned is you don't celebrate getting things done because there's always somebody to say, well, yeah, but it's not really done that well or not everybody likes it, you know. A lot of people, most people in New Jersey were helped by that, but bad drivers wound up paying more, and it turns out there's a lot of bad drivers in New Jersey. <laughs> so, you know, one of the lessons there was you can do something right, you can solve a problem, and that doesn't mean everybody's going to write newspaper stories saying, this problem is solved, the governor did it. You know, no reporter's going to take it upon themselves to decide that you did something right. And so kind of the lesson that I learned in that is it's always going to be kind of a battle. You're always going to have to fight to get your message out. You're always going to have to fight to get perception that you did something right. You don't just sort of get applauded because you solved a problem. So the headline from that little episode is Batmobile Backfires. <laughs> didn't, didn't, well, you know, the policy stood, and, it, and it's a good policy, and the state was helped. But from a media standpoint, we didn't get much from the battle. All right. The next major battle, which was much more of a pitched public battle, yeah. was assault weapons. Yeah. And there, you did run a campaign. Yeah. How did that develop? Well, it was a campaign that we started in the election campaign. You know, it, it was the right thing to do. And we knew people in the state wanted it. You know, New Jersey is a, is a fairly progressive state when it comes to issues like choice, when it comes to, to, to guns. So we knew that the public was pretty strong in wanting an assault weapon ban. And the problem would be the legislature and, you know, obviously the NRA is a very strong lobbying presence. And, you know, we call people, the NRA was there in flannel shirts and <laughs> windows got broken in the legislative uh, chambers and it was, it, was a, it was a fairly ugly fight, but it wasn't that long a fight and it wasn't that difficult f a fight because in the end, you know, legislators knew where public opinion was and they, and, they, and they supported it. Now, it had repercussions down the line that we'll talk about, but I think that you know, it, was a, it was a clear win for the governor. He kept a campaign promise. He did something important to public safety in the state and something that we knew that folks in the state wanted. Now, Democratic legislators supported it and one Republican yeah. uh, supported it, but none of the other Republicans did. Um, so there, and, and I, I don't recall that that was the case with auto insurance. I think auto yeah, insurance was, right. a, was a more bipartisan yeah. uh, support. So already now you're beginning to sow the seeds of some, bi some, some partisanship that's mm -hmm. going to develop there. Uh, how much of a consideration was that in, in pushing this agenda? Or again, was there an absolute feeling on the part of the administration that this is the right thing to do and we're going to push it through? Yeah, I mean, and it was the right thing to do. And I think on a, on a 
an issue like that on a criminal justice social issue, if you will, I don't think you worry too much about it being bipartisan because you're doing something the public wants. You know, so if you can do something that you know the people of New Jersey want, the fact that you only did it with Democrats is actually might be an asset that will hurt the Republicans. That's their business. They don't want to be part of something that the public is that in favor. It's very different from taxes. You know, mm -hmm. so so I, I think the feeling at the time was fine. If they don't want to support a ban on assault weapons that the public is very much in favor of, go for it. And and I think um, also at the same time, um, two other initiatives: the Clean Water Enforcement Act. Uh, and the appointment of the first environmental yep. prosecutor were also sort of no-brainers, yep. not not a whole lot, no no major opposition there, yep. and those so those also sort of sped along without much difficulty, yeah. and and then comes um, education reform and tax reform, mm -hmm. which are part and parcel Absolutely. of the same thing. Um, certainly, one of the questions that a lot of people have asked: um, the Florio administration or the governor uh, decided that in anticipation of a Supreme Court decision on Abbott versus Burke uh, requiring a, a, a reform of the way in which education was being financed. He went ahead and proposed the Quality Education Act and the tax changes that would uh, result. Mm -hmm. um, was it, in your estimation, in, in retrospect, you know, obviously it's 2020 hindsight, um, did he do the right thing to anticipate that and get out in front of it, or would it have been more politically astute to wait for the Supreme Court to make the announcement, blame the court for having forced the administration's hand, and then gone ahead with the proposal? Let me just say at the beginning, my vision is so bad, even my <laughs> hindsight is in 2020. Um, but, you know, again, there was, there was precedent, you know, one, one, and maybe cross-cutting precedents, because one thing that, that guided you was get it done as quickly as you can and have the maximum amount of time to recover from it politically. Knowing you know, that this was going to be a blow politically. Well, sure. I mean, you know, you don't get, they don't screw rose petals in your paths when you raise taxes. Um, but there was, all, but there, and there also was precedent, you know, of saying, well, wait till you're forced to do it, you know. I mean, Brendan Byrne did try to do the income tax before the Supreme Court closed the schools, but then when they did, that provided the leverage. Tom Kane, you know, managed to publicly say, I'm holding my nose while he signed tax increases, that apparently he was behind closed doors hours earlier begging Democrats to vote for so he could get the revenue that he needed. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard question, and I want to give a, a decent answer to it. It is possible in retrospect that had we waited, things would have gone better. Um, that we could have said, well, we don't want to do this, but, you know, the Supreme Court says. A couple problems with that, though. Number one, our problem wasn't just that we had to increase school funding because we knew the court was going to say that we needed to. The state had, you know, what the experts call a structural deficit. We were spending more money than we were taking in because we had an antiquated tax structure that wasn't up to the times and the needs of the state, and that still relied so heavily on property taxes. So when we raised taxes, it wasn't just for, for the school formula. It was also to put the state back on secure financial footing. You couldn't blame that on the Supreme Court. The other feature was, and you know, this is the sort of cutting edge, or the, the dual cutting edge of leadership. You know, here was a governor who basically said, look, I know what we got to do. Let's just do it. Let's get it done. I don't need to, I'm not, I'm not into theatrics here. I don't want to create a crisis and then respond to it. I was elected to solve the problems of the state and to do the things that I think are right. And are so, those conversations that you personally had with, I mean, do you recall Jim Florio actually making that position clear to his staff early on? Not in so many words, but, but, I, but it, it was communicated, I think, just through actions. Like, we're going we're gonna to get this done. And, you know, in conversations with him, you knew that he felt, look, we got to do this. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like he wasn't trying to set up an ideological theatrical situation where you could say, I'm against taxes, but okay, I'll raise them. You know, he knew that, that, that progressive taxation is a good thing. So we raised the income tax, but only on people making over a certain amount of money. You know, we raised the sales tax a penny. That was not something that was widely applauded, but it was necessary. And, and you know, he made it clear that he felt the most important thing is we got to get this state back on a firm financial footing. And politically, that'll be better the way it was for Tom Kane because then we'll have the revenue that we need. Now, one other thing that made it kind of a complicated factor, Tom Kane raised taxes and the national economy was on the verge of improving and so we were rolling in money. Jim Florio had the misfortune of raising taxes just as the recession was hitting. So the economy didn't get better and it was easy for folks to say the tax increase somehow 
put the economy in a tailspin, which is irrational, but makes for good copy. When um, the decision was made to uh, reform the school funding, one of the major pieces of that was a change to the pension laws, yeah. uh, which greatly angered the New Jersey Education Association, widely viewed at the time and perhaps still to this day as the yeah. most powerful lobbying group um, uh, or interest group um, in, in Trenton. Um, so now you have alienated the automobile insurance companies, you've alienated the National Rifle Association, um, you may have alienated a few polluters, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're not going to make that uh, much of an issue. But you've also alienated the teachers. You now have a, 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 a string of uh, interest groups, powerful interest groups, um, who are not inclined to be uh, friendly to Jim Florio. Um, was the teacher pension reform a mistake? Could, could, could that have been handled in a different way? Uh, so that you would at least not have had that very powerful group as your, as your new enemy? Well, and first of all, no part of the strategy was that we wanted to alienate teachers or get them angry at us. Um, you know, the governor's wife is a teacher. He, he had gone to school to possibly be a teacher when he was at Trenton State College. He had a lot of respect for the teaching profession. The question is, where do you get the money to solve the state's financial problems? And part of it was, let's not pay for the pensions anymore. Let's still guarantee the pensions, which kind of got misunderstood. No teacher was ever in danger of losing their pension, but they'd come out of the local pot. Instead, it'd be part of your, your settlement when you negotiated the contract, and of course it meant that, that you might then get a, a, a smaller pay increase because some of that money was going to go to pension. So I can explain it now again today, and it sounds pretty rational to me, um, but I also totally understand um, how, it, how it got perceived. So, you know, I don't know what an alternate scenario might have been to... Um, to where we'd get the money if we, if we didn't do that. But it would be crazy for me not to say in retrospect, gee, I wish we'd found a way to do that without doing that to the teachers. So, you know, because in the end, they, they decided not to endorse in the 1993 campaign. They were, they were neutral, which mm -hmm. is, you know, if you can't get the teachers to endorse you, that's, well, that's a, a bad if thing. A, if a Democratic well, exactly, uh, yeah. candidate. So, yeah. um, so, you know, I would say that if, if you, you can second guess everything. I'm not second guessing assault weapons, car insurance, tax increases. It, it might have been better if we found a, a different way to get that pot of money mm -hmm. and not through the teachers' pensions. Um, all right, you're, you're now into the summer of 1990, um, and the Florio administration is under siege. Uh, you have gone from a very well orchestrated campaign where you controlled the message uh, to a very well orchestrated first six months of the administration where you have hit the ground running and done all these things and now all of a sudden you are you are on the major defensive. How do you handle that? Well I would say we are perceived to be under siege but it's probably a small, a small point. Um, I remember going to the State House on a Sunday to peek out the window and look at the rally on July 1st, the anti-tax rally, and thinking, this is pretty ugly, this is pretty nasty. And I remember going to the State House the next day and telling people, and they said, ah, oh, you know, it'll blow over when the weather gets cool and the summer's over, and that kind of stuff. And I didn't say anything, but I thought, mm, I'm not so sure of this. Because really we saw the precursor of the Tea Party. You know, we really saw that kind of discipline, finances, media savvy, everything, you know, that... that 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 turned out to be. And so it was tough. It was, it was clearly a tough thing because we were on the defensive. This, this outfit called Hands Across New Jersey, you know, fomented by a, a radio station that decided its key to ratings was to be the New Jersey radio station, um, you know, help behind the scenes from the Republican Party, from the NRA for sure. So, I mean, I would go so far as to say banning assault weapons was the right thing to do. And if we hadn't done it, Jim Florey might have been reelected because the NRA would have had no reason to get involved in the tax revolt, which if you're reading this in the transcript, I just used air quotes around. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a pretty big deal. And, you know, the, we, we, we knew a couple of things. You know, we did focus groups during that tough time. Independent voters in Middlesex County. And they were angry. They didn't like the way the state was going, their lives were going, the government. They didn't like anything. It was a tough time. But at the end of two hours, you asked them the only question that really mattered. You'd say, have you given up on Jim Florio? Or is your feeling that you want to wait until four years are up and then you'll make a decision? 
And everybody would say, oh, I give him four years. I want to see how he does four years. And you wanted to go to the press and say, people have not given up on us. We're not off the radar screen. Mm -hmm. you know? But instead, I, can, I recall going to a New York Times reporter and saying, you know, you ought to take a look at some of the things we're doing to help middle class people in the state, like, like for first time home buyers and for, for college financial help. And he said, come back to me when he's higher in the polls. And I was like, wow, really? You know, and their feeling was every day, how's he doing? You know, is he going to get above 20%? And so it was hard to get a message out. It was very hard to do, to do any of that because the, the press is your conduit for that. And their view was, oh, you know, the only story here is, is he going to survive this? When we knew, you get four years to run that campaign. Why was this, why was the media environment as, I mean, you've just described a fairly hostile media yeah. environment. Yeah. Uh, I know that 101.5 was hostile. Uh, and the Hands Across New Jersey movement fed into that. But how did the mainstream, you just mentioned the New York Times as an yeah. example, how was it that the mainstream media at this point also began to become hostile and, and to pile on? I think there's a perception, you know, and you, you've seen this happen at the national level. Um, if you're not doing well as measured by the polls, there is a perception that you're not doing well. You're not doing your job. Your job was to get elected and make people happy and be popular. And so I think that's part of it, and it feeds on itself. You know? And you know, maybe our disciplined campaign in the, in the general election made people think we were too disciplined and they needed to kind of penetrate us and they couldn't take what we said at face value. But I think a lot of it was just kind of a, a changing media environment. I remember that you know, the, the Friday before that anti-tax rally, the Asbury Park Press ran a map on the front page. Here's where to get to Trenton for the rally. And I thought, would they do that for an abortion rights rally? You know, would they do it if they didn't own the radio station that was fomenting the rally? So and, a lot and of things. We should point changed. out that the Asbury Park Press did own well, exactly. 101.5, yeah. yeah. which was was part of that. And so I think there was a a bit of a change in the in the way reporters were seeing their jobs. I remember, you know, one time a, a reporter came to me and he said, I want a response to you from this thing that Chuck High Tyen just said. He was the assembly minority leader over that time. Maybe he was a speaker after they took control. And so I gave a response and he said, oh, that's just spin. And I thought, well, what is it what, what the other guy gave you? Isn't that just spin too? You know, and there was just this idea that you, anybody can criticize you and they're credible, but your response has to be judged by a kind of a different standard. And I found that perplexing at times. Let's go back a little bit. Um, actually, I have several questions that come out of that, but mm -hmm. before we get to that, uh, you are the communications director. You're not the press secretary. Yeah. All right? So there's somebody else, I think it was Emma Byrne, That's in right. fact, who when questions would be asked of the governor and he was not available mm -hmm. or you know, they needed a, a statement from the governor, mm -hmm. Uh, it would be Emma who would mm -hmm. who would make those statements. You were not the well. Spokesman. We were involved together, but yes, that's right. But you were not the spokesman. That's right. You were responsible for sort of the overarching that's right. themes. You know, reporters could come to me, and some did, but generally, day to day, they would go to the press. Secretary. One other sort of question off to the side here: Every one of the cabinet officers has a director of communications right. or a press secretary or something like that. Uh, and different administrations have had uh, different relationships between the front office director of communications and the communications apparatus of each of the agencies. How much of a hands-on relationship did you have or direction in terms of how each of those agencies behaved? How autonomous or independent were they or how much was the message of each of the agencies controlled from the front office? Not controlled that much. We didn't really try to have a heavy hand with that. We wanted them to keep us informed, certainly let us know about good things that are happening so maybe we can get the governor involved and certainly let us know if bad things are happening so we can be prepared. But I remember during that time um, I was at a National Governors Association meeting and I was talking to the press secretary of the governor of South Carolina and he said, you know, we just changed in South Carolina. We're going to appoint a lot more cabinet members and uh, in, in elect fewer of them. And he said, I know you guys appoint them in New Jersey. How does that go? And I said, well, it doesn't mean that you'll never wake up in the morning and pick up a newspaper and see something you didn't know you were going to see. You know, it's just, that's, that's just kind of the way it is. How much of a role did you or the governor's office play in appointing the press secretaries of each of the cabinet officers, or did they have autonomy in choosing their own? I don't recall playing much of a role. I think it wasn't unusual for them to come and say, we want to hire so-and-so, what do you think? And pretty much saying, sure, if that's the person you want, you should hire them. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to the siege. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You mentioned that the NRA uh, was, uh, was actively involved from the assault weapons ban on in, in, in terms of um, campaigning against the governor. Um, I mean, was, was the NRA directly involved in the Hands Across New Jersey movement? Were they involved over the next couple of years in undercutting the administration? Yeah, behind the scenes, but for sure. I remember one day, for example, when 
Hands Across New Jersey came to the State House with their petitions. You know, it's interesting, they said, we're going to get a million petitions signed, and we're going to present them to the governor to show the opposition to this, this tax increase. So they get all these petitions. They refuse to let the press look at them, which you'd think the press would say, then we're not going to write about this. And then in the end, they said, and we're not going to give them to the governor either, because he'll just write letters to these people with propaganda. So it's like, you said you're going to collect pet petitions. You're not going to let anybody see them. You're not going to give them to the governor. At what point do people stop writing about you because you're not credible? But that day, when they displayed the, the, the petitions out in front of the state house, in the back, sort of by the cars parked in the street, was a contract lobbyist for the NRA, you know, who was also advising hands across New Jersey. So sure, you know, there was, there was a lot of involvement there. Part of the frustration was if you went to reporters and said, you ought to take a look at the Republicans and the NRA, they're really pretty involved with this anti-tax movement. And the reporters would say, so are you trying to tell me that people aren't upset? I'd say, no, no, people are upset, but, and they, they, somehow it always seemed to them like we were trying to say everything's fine, nobody's upset. And, and they didn't, didn't take the cue until later, you know, right after the election. A reporter for the Gloucester County Times wrote a series of stories about how directly the NRA was involved with Hands Across New Jersey. And I remember saying to this guy, that was a great, great series of, uh, of, um, of stories. And he said, well, you know, I never could have written them before the election. And I said, gee, why not? I, I kind of wish that you had. <laughs> and he said, well, it would look like I was supporting the governor. And I said, well, you know, why do you care whether you are or aren't? Isn't, if, it, if it happened, don't you, don't you report it? And this, you know, he's 20-something, says to me, well, what do you think the role of the press is? And I said, I think the role of the press is to find out what's happening and tell people. He said, no, 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 the role of the press is to whoever's in power hold their feet to the fire. You know, in, in as much as saying we give more credence to the attacks than we do to the defense. So it was kind of an interesting lesson for me about where we'd been, but again, it kind of heightened the frustration in that regard. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly enough, my recollection again, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that most of the newspapers in the state editorially supported yeah. the decisions that the governor had made. That's right, some great editorials. Yeah. Um, yet, you, there seems to be some disconnection between the editorial positions of those papers and the way in which you characterize the reporters who were covering the state house. Well, the to the media's credit, reporters don't take their cues from, from what the editorial page opines, and the editorial page doesn't take its cues from how the news is being covered, so that's fine. But there is, you know, I was, I was part of it too. I told you, I was one of the people in Tom Kane's first year who said, this guy's finished. You know, so there is a bit of a pack mentality in the media, and they did perceive that we were under siege. I remember, you know, one time the governor went and gave a, a talk to county prosecutors about some technical changes in the death penalty law. And the next day there was a story saying, seeking to divert attention from the tax increase, the governor, you know, it's like, what? You know, we're still governing. There's a lot of other issues around here. So there was that tendency of the press to look at everything through the lens of how's he doing, how's his popularity, is he going to survive this thing? How, um, it seems to me that, 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 that there's a fundamental change that took place in the early 90s in, in terms of the relationship between the press and government. Um, and maybe even a, 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 a fairly significant change in terms of the relationship between the minority party and the, and the majority party. Uh, it, it, politics in New Jersey were never overly collegial, but they were never overly partisan either. Uh, the press was never a handmaiden of the administration, but neither was it overly critical of, of previous administrations. Uh, you mentioned the Tea Party. Yeah. Um, and the fact that, that in some respects you think that 1990, 91 was kind of a watershed in, in changing the, both the media atmosphere and the political climate in the state. And I'm wondering if you'd elaborate on that. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's, if the, if the hands across New Jersey was kind of a tea party to come later, um, the Republican legislature was kind of like the Newt Gingrich era and where we are today now in Congress. It, it seemed to well, me... It only predates the Newt Gingrich era well, by right. a, a year or That's two. right. Um, it seemed to me like the Republicans made a decision. When Jim Florio took office, they knew he had to raise taxes. And, it, and, and they, their disciplined decision seemed to be, we're not going to help him. He's on his own. As far as we're concerned, the 1993 campaign starts today. And so, you know, it was like, if you've got to do it, do it yourself, and we're going to be the party that didn't raise taxes. And so, and you know, I remember, you know, we got beat up a little bit because people said, oh, Jim Florio said the Republicans are irrelevant. And actually, he didn't say that. He said, if they don't want to help us solve this problem, they risk being irrelevant, you know. Uh, but they yelled louder than we did, and they kind of got that, that message out there. But it, it, it was clear on, on budget and tax issues, there wasn't going to be bipartisanship. And that certainly makes it tougher. I mean, look, Tom Kane got two tax increases passed early in his first term because the Democrats in the assembly gave him the majority he needed to do it. That's a whole different atmosphere from what we faced. 
Okay, 1991 election. Um, the Democrats get their head handed to them. Um, and veto-proof majorities come into the, to the uh, legislature. This changes the whole ballgame. And certainly the, the second two years of the Florio administration are very different from the first two. Um, what's the mood in the governor's office like uh, after November uh, 1991 for that yeah. first, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe a few days after the election and what you have in store? You know, I have to say that in the Florio administration, it wasn't really about moods. You know, it was really about coming to work and doing what you had to do. I mean, I'm not saying we were happy about it, nor were we were necessarily all that surprised by it by the time the votes were counted. But, you know, I always, one of the things I admire about Jim Florio is that he kind of reminds me of a pilot. It's like, okay, forget plan A, what's plan B? You know, it's not, oh, my, woe is me, we're, we're done here. It's like, okay, let, what are we going to do next? You know, and, and that was kind of the way it was. And, you know, he's not the kind of guy who you say, well, how do you feel? You know, in fact, I remember one time, this, this is really funny, there was a reporter who used to like to ask questions, Governor, how do you feel? You know, so one day when we had an interview scheduled with that reporter, totally on his own, the governor was in the cabinet room and there's a couch that you can sit on, and the governor went in and he actually lay down on the couch <laughs> and he said to the reporter, well, it all started when I was a child. You know? <laughs> and that was him being funny, you know. So, um, so, you know, he has a sense of humor and doesn't show it much in public, which is probably a good idea for a politician. But, you know, it was kind of like, what do we do? You know, I remember that, that on election night, um, Governor Florio called Dick Hughes because he'd also lost in the legislative election midway through his term. So we were able to have a press conference next day. So, well, I talked to Dick Hughes, and he said, you know, if you're doing what's right, you've got to stick with it. So I think that, I think both outwardly and inwardly, the mood was, all right, come on, this is going to be tough, but we know we're doing the right things, and we've got to look for opportunities. And, you know, and as, as bad as it was to lose control of the legislature, in some small way, it's also a little bit liberating. You know, now you can, you, can, you can do and say what you believe, and it's going to be us against them, and you're going to fight it out. Mm -hmm. And it was you against them Absolutely. for the next two years. Yeah. Um, the, the, um, the budget was, over, was, was defeated. Yep. Um, the Florio budget was defeated. Um, uh, he vetoed the, the legislative budget. They overrode right. the veto. Highly unusual. Um, yeah. I think unprecedented, if, I, if I'm not be. mistaken. And, and, and so now you're dealing with a Republican budget. Yep. Um, I guess the one major victory uh, that was achieved was um, avoiding having the assault weapons ban. Over well, that was huge. The Republicans in the Assembly repealed the assault weapon ban, and the governor went on the road for, for a long period of time before public audiences trying to make sure we could put pressure on the Senate to not vote to repeal. And in the end, the Senate didn't cast a vote at all. So that was preserved. So, you know, you could, you could still win. You know, I, I believe the Republicans rolled back the penny increase in the sales tax, but didn't roll back the income tax increase. That would wait until Governor Whitman took office. So, um, so you know, it was the lines were clearly drawn, and you, and you went about your business. Now, did you, um, in, in terms of your personal relationship with members of the legislature, um, did you find that, that in dealing with Republican legislators now, there was a different, there was a different, um, I don't know what the word is I'm trying to think of, um, atmosphere, uh, 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 the, not collegiality, but uh, uh, Jim Florio talks about the fact that, that uh, there were actually a number of, of uh, effective uh, pieces of legislation that were passed in those last yeah. two years yeah. because there necessarily had to be a Well, that, that, that's right. I mean, my individual relationships were more with the media than, than with legislators, but you could see some differences. One, yes, Republicans had to work with you. They were now responsible for half of the government. So it wasn't enough for them to just attack you and criticize you. They had to have legislation. And the flip side, and this is something that President Obama is experiencing with the Democrats in the House, it's hard to make your own party happy when they're in the minority because they want you to deal with them, but they can't get anything passed. You have to deal. You know, President Clinton had the same problem when he was dealing with mm -hmm. Republicans in, in Congress as well. So it's not a pleasant kind of a situation. You're kind of like making deals every day with the enemy, and you can't do anything with your friends because they don't have any power. So it's, you know, all you can do is hopefully look forward to when that situation is going to change. Did you find that there was a change in the, uh, in the media? in the way in which the media viewed the administration after that midterm election? Were they more sympathetic in, in, in some ways? Not that I can recall, <laughs> um, because the situation was the same. Their issue is still, is, is Jim Florio going to get reelected? Is he going to recover from where he is in the polls? So I, I don't recall a lot of change in that dynamic. Now, I recall that you actually, uh, uh, I don't know if, it's, if volunteered is the right word, 
you ended up spending a lot more yeah. time with the governor in the second half of the administration than you had in the first half. The first half you were focused on, as you said, the, the communications directorship, yeah. sort of the overarching themes. You spent more time going out on the road and doing the retail yeah. work with the governor. Well, the I second. wanted to redefine the role into the things that I thought I could contribute the most on. And so I sent a memo to the governor and the chief of staff saying, you know, I, I'd like to get back to more day-to-day -day dealing with the press. I'd like to give up being in charge of the speech writing, for example, and kind of get on the road more and just kind of do the kinds of things that we did a lot during the campaign and that sort of thing. And they both said, yeah, that's a good idea. So I did more day-to-day -day work with the press. One of the interesting lessons that I learned from that is I think we put out a little press release kind of announcing that I'd be doing these things. And the next day, all the papers wrote a story about it, some on, on the front page. And it detailed this change in my functions. And it also quoted an unnamed administration source saying I was being demoted because I wasn't doing a good job. I thought, whoa, this whole thing was my idea. Who's this source you know, who knows something that I don't know? And I remember I, I've often told people this about what it's like to go from a reporter writing about things to being written about. And you prepare for it in your head. But when you actually read the story, you get a physical sensation in your gut. And I remember that. And I thought, wow, now I know what it's like to be governor and have that every day. You know, so it was, it was, it was, there was a lesson. I don't know who the source was. I'd still like to find out. But it was, um, it was really kind of interesting that something that was totally your own idea, you presented it and got accepted, that somebody could still find somebody to say something about it that was totally untrue. And did you go to that reporter and say that's not true? It or was all the reporters. Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I also know Mark Twain's expression that you don't argue with people who buy ink by the barrel. Mm -hmm. So you let it go and you go on to the next thing. Um, you mentioned speech writing. Was that in a, 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 uh, an important part of your position in the first couple of years of the Yeah, we had a couple of speech writers and I supervised the work that they did to help, you know, help get the message where we wanted to be, help people be comfortable with what the governor wanted to say and that sort of thing. How involved were you in the actual, in the major speeches that the governor gave? How, did you actually write some of them or were you editing them? Or One both? who's ever been involved in speech writing acknowledges that the president or the governor writes all their speeches. Um, but yes, but let's, <laughs> let's talk about what really yes, happens. I had, some <laughs> I had some involvement in writing some speeches and I was, I was especially involved in writing the final um, state of the state speech as he was leaving office. Ah. And, and that was a very reflective speech, as I recall. Well, we decided, you know, my thought was there's no sense giving a laundry list of issues when you're going to be gone the next week. So it was all about property taxes. And it was all about how we need to do this. You know, I tried. Other governors have tried. We brought Bill Cahill to come to it because he was another governor who didn't get reelected after trying to raise taxes. And, um, and you know, I think if someone goes back and reads that now, it's, it's, it, it serves as a vindication, you know. Those problems continue to exist. We still have a problem in New Jersey over relying on property taxes. We still get caught in debates about cutting the income tax, about in effect fixing the only tax in the state that's not broken, you know, and it continues. And I think that he kind of laid down a marker saying, you know, we did the right things in this administration. We didn't get to have a second term, but we still need to deal with these things. Were you at that point still on the state payroll or had you, were you involved in his reelection campaign? How, what, well, I went, yeah. For a period during the re-election campaign, I went off the state payroll. Then after the election, I went back on the state payroll until Governor Whitman took office. Oh, I see. So 1993, he's running for re-election. Right. Uh, in the spring, I guess, did you go No, off actually, the well, there was no primary, so there was no All need right. to do that in the spring. So, Joe Gladding was the press secretary during the campaign, but, you know, late, as, as the election got closer, I went off and helped her do that stuff on the campaign. It was actually kind of funny because then I go back on the state payroll, which... Why not? I, I had been the communications director. And the Trentonian at the time had this little snarky feature called Geek of the Week, where they kind of blasted somebody in the administration. I was the only person ever to be Geek of the Week on two different weeks. They, de they decided that was, I was robbing the taxpayers by going back on the payroll to take my old job back after the governor lost. But, mm -hmm. so um, and and that, those last few weeks in office, um, well, I'll ask you the question that everybody always asks. How did Jim Florio feel? <laughs> well, th you know, I'll tell you something that I, that I think says a lot about Jim Florio, okay? The day after the election, I, came, I wanted to see him as I normally would do it. And I didn't ask him how he was doing, okay? He said to me, are you okay? And that, that to me said a lot. You know, he was always that kind of a guy. He didn't, you didn't worry about how he felt. He, con he was concerned about how you felt. I remember one time during the administration, my, my assistant had worked in the Kane administration. And she's outside my office and she buzzes me. And I say hello, and she, she says, there's a gym on the line. Would that be the governor? 
you know, because he called me. So this is Jim. Is John there? You know, so so you know, when you, you get to know this person, and he cares a lot about the people he works for. He treats you well. Now, true, he expects you to do a, a good job. I remember one time during the campaign, some staffer had done a particularly good job to set up an event, and another staffer said, you know, you ought to, you ought to thank that person or, or send him a note. You know, and Jim said, well, we're paying them, right? You know, so that's kind of the way he was. He expected you to do your job, but he was very appreciative about, you know, one, one time I was at home late at night, and the phone rings. My wife answers the phone. She puts her hand over the, re over the microphone. She says, it's Jim on the line. I think he's angry. And I said, hello, and he goes, I'm not mad. <laughs> <laughs> so he always, you know, he just kind of dealt with things. He didn't, he's not the kind of guy you say, are you okay? How do you feel, you know? Um, but you know that he's got a kind of an inner strength and a toughness. And, you know, his way of letting off steam was to go out in the middle of the afternoon and go run. And then he'd come back and do events at night. You know, and that's, that's, how, that's how he dealt with those kinds of things. And you didn't really worry about, is he taking this okay? You know, one time, I, the most upset I saw him, is when he met with the two leaders of Hands Across New Jersey, privately. Nobody else in the room but the three of them. He came back out, he was, he was upset. He said he was livid. He said, I explained to that guy that my income tax increase didn't affect him. And he said back to me, but I might be a millionaire someday. You know? And this kind of, that kind of stuff. So you know, his, his view was, I just want to be rational. I want to explain things to people. And he had some faith that if you explain things to people, they'll understand, they might disagree. And, in the supercharged climate that we were in, the media, the politics, and everything else, it was hard. I had an experience myself. I remember going up during the tax days and talking to a group of accountants in Morris County and saying, well, let me explain how the tax increase is going to work, who it's going to affect, who it's not going to affect. And I finished, and somebody said, I don't believe you. And I'm like, well, I just told you the truth. You don't believe me? And so that was kind of sobering. You know, that, and and, I, and I, I wasn't the governor. How does it feel to be the governor? To know you're doing the right thing. I mean, the state's finances were screwed up. Somebody had to get in charge of that. And I don't expect, think he expected to be applauded for it, but I think he expected and had a reason to expect that at least people would think you're telling the truth and would listen to you and make their decision, which in the end, in the campaign, they did. Before we wrap this up with uh, sort of what you've been doing since the, uh, since the end of the administration, um, are there any other thoughts, reflections, Things that you expected me to ask that I didn't ask. <laughs> things that you remember that you'd like other people to, uh, to, uh, to share. Well, one of the things that always struck me was making that change from being a reporter to working in government, to sort of going to the other side, as it were. On the one hand, I liked it because... The, the I, dark side. The dark, some well, it wasn't so dark. <laughs> um, I liked being an advocate. You know, the very first press release I wrote in Congress was criticizing somebody, and I wrote the press release, and for a half a second I thought, well, I have to go call him up and get his reaction. And I was like, no, wait a minute, I only have to tell half the story. This is great, I can go home now. But the thing I, I used to tell people is like, when I was a reporter, I didn't know much, but I got to tell 200,000 people the next day. When I went to work inside government, I knew a whole lot more, but I couldn't tell anybody. You know, that was kind of the frustration. But I enjoyed it. And the, and the thing that I took away from, from four years in government was there are a lot of people in state government trying hard to do the right thing, and boy, are they up against a lot when they try. And I thought that, you know, to me, that was, I'm not, I won't say it was surprising, but it was something that I took from it, and I felt that, you know, that I think public service is a high calling. I think working in government is a great thing to do. Everybody should, should give it a try, and I think if you do, you, come away, you might come away with a little different attitude toward what those people are up to. One of the things that other people who have made that, that jump from journalist to um, press secretary or communications director have, have made mention of is that they feel as though the, the transition has been that in the past they would go delving into trying to get information uh, and then report it. As the press secretary, the communications director, they're performing the same function inside the agency or yeah. inside the government. A question comes in, you're going to play the role of the press, go in, get the answer to that question, turn around, give it to the reporter who's asking. Yeah. Is that a, a major, was that a major component of the work that it's you did? It's part of it. I remember, and it's funny because, you know, people who know you used to be a reporter who are now inside state government, they don't know necessarily to trust you at the beginning. So you'd start to ask them questions and they'd be as guarded with you as you were, as they were if you were a reporter. And I can remember at one point saying to somebody, look, just tell me everything, then we'll figure out what to say. You know, it's like, but I got to know it all. You know, I, I remember reading a great biography of Edward R. Murrow, who was for years, you know, a leading journalist for CBS. But then he went to work in the Kennedy administration for the U.S. Information Agency. And when he was interviewing for the job, he said, if you want me there for the crash landings, I've got to be there for the takeoffs. 
you know? And so to his credit, I think Jim Florio saw that model. It's like, I want you in the room to understand these things so you can explain them. You're not the guy who sits outside the door. When we're done, we'll tell you what to say. And you, you, know? and you were there for both the takeoffs and the crash landings <laughs> in, in the Florio As it happened. What have you been doing since? So after I left, the, after, I say after the voters decided not to give me a second term as communications <laughs> director, I went to work for three years at the 20th Century Fund, a think tank uh, in New York. And that gave me the idea to start New Jersey Policy Perspective, which would be an organization that would do tax and budget work and help with strategic communications to help shape the terms of debate at the state level in ways I wished somebody was doing when we were in the administration on, on tax and budget issues. And I did that for 12 years, and now I work for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in Washington, helping the network of state groups that we coordinate like NJPP. Well, John, I want to thank you very much for your time, and uh, thank you for coming to Eagleton today. It was a pleasure.